In this video, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the communication disorders and button up the rest of the child adolescent psychiatry topics. So communication disorders. Disorders of communication, they include deficits in language, speech, and other forms of verbal and nonverbal communications. And of course, DSM-5, like it does for everything else, has specific definitions for what is speech, what is language, and what is communication. So that's the next part that we're going to talk about here is what is first speech. So speech is excessive production of sounds and includes articulation, fluency, voice, and resonance quality. The next one is language. Now language includes the use of a system of symbols and it's used in a rule-based manner to produce communication. And of course that leads into what is communication. So communication includes any verbal or nonverbal communication that influences behavior, ideas, and attitudes of another individual. So that is the way that our book, the DSM-5, kind of lays it out or sets the framework for these communication disorders. So obviously you can have people we're going to have deficits in speech, you're going to have people who have difficulty with language, and of course uh, communication as well. So let's go into what some of those disorders include. Starting of course with the language disorders. So going back for a second to just remind ourselves, language is the system of symbols that we use in a rule-based manner to produce some kind of communication. So let's see how that would play out in terms of a disorder. So the diagnostic features of language disorder are difficulties in the acquisition and use of language due to deficits in either comprehension or production of vocabulary, sentence structure, and discourse ability to use, and that in discourse means the ability to use vocabulary and connect sentences to explain a topic or have a conversation. So it's a really, really wordy kind of definition of what defines like a, the diagnostic features of a language disorder. Um, again, these are relatively low yield, I feel like, overall, but if you're going into child adolescent psychiatry, will certainly be things you want to be aware of. The language abilities are substantially and quantifiably below those expected for the age resulting in functional limitations. So, of course, it has to cause some kind of problem, right? This is common in any DSM-5 diagnosis that you're ever going to look at. It's going to have to cause some kind of problem in the patient's life, because if it's not causing a problem, then it's really not an issue, right? So we have to have some deficit in their ability to function. The difficulties are, of course, are not going to be attributable to things like sensory impairment. So a common board question when you're studying for like step two, step three, is, you know, the child comes in, is not developing language or not developing uh, any kind of speech at an early, at an age when they should start to say some words. So what's one of the first things you want to do? You want to send them for, um, you know, hearing test because you want to know, is this, for, is this child having some kind of difficulty with their hearing? Are they having some kind of difficulty with vision? You know, is there a motor dysfunction there? Is there a neurological disability that we're not aware of? So all of those things, of course, have to be ruled out before you go to saying that this is some kind of language disorder. The next is the speech sound disorders. So the diagnostic features of all the speech sound disorders include persistent difficulty with speech, sound production, that interferes with intelligible uh, or prevents um, verbal communications or messages. So it prevents them from being understood. It prevents them from communicating verbal messages. Obviously, this disturbance again causes limitations and makes it difficult for them for social participation, academic achievement, or occupational performance. The onset is in the early developmental period and the difficulties are not due to any, again, congenital or acquired conditions like cerebral palsy might come to mind, uh, if the child has cleft lip, cleft palate, if the child is deaf, if there's a history of any TBI at an early age, or use of medication or neurological condition. So overall, speech should be intelligible by the age of four and is typically developing, in, in typical developing children, at the age of two, only 50% might be understood. So that's kind of an important point there. It gives you basically the framework to start to know when speech should start to become um, understood. And that's by the age of four. And then at the age of two, a lot of kids are, you know, creating some kind of speech, able to communicate to some degree, but they're only 50% might be actually understood. So the words are not quite as clear as you would like them to be. So that covers speech sound disorders. The next one is the childhood onset fluency disorder, AKA stuttering. So formerly known as stuttering, now we have a very long cumbersome uh, term here, childhood onset fluency disorder. The main feature of this disorder is disturbance in normal fluency and time patterning of speech. 
and it's inappropriate for individuals' age and language skill set. So again, it's always not, it has to cause some kind of problem, and it has to be inappropriate for the level at which that child should be at at that particular age and developmental stage, essentially. So this is difficulty, again, with fluency and time and pattern of speech. Um, it must persist over time and have frequent occurrences of one or more of the following. So it must persist over time and have one or more of the following. Sound and syllable repetitions, sound prolongations of consonants as well as vowels, broken words, pauses within a word, audible or silent sentence blocking, um, circumlocations, word, which would be word substitution to avoid problematic words. So they essentially the child would avoid words that they're not able to say very well. Words produced within excess of physical tension and monosyllabic, monosyllabic whole word repetitions. So it's quite a bit of stuff there, but obviously, you know, if you were in a clinical setting and you had a child with childhood onset fluency disorder, you would start to notice it and then you could more so quantify exactly what the problem is. Are they, you know, is it is it prolongation of constants and vowels? Is it broken words? Is it uh, sentence blocking? Is it uh, avoiding words that they can't say properly? So what exactly is the problem? The disturbance has to cause anxiety about speaking or limitations in the effective communication, in effective communication. So again, it causes some kind of disturbance in the patient's life. And the onset occurs by age of six when for 80 to 90 percent of the affected individuals. So that's kind of a maybe testable point there is that uh, onset is usually by the age of six for a majority of people, and almost all cases occur before the age of 10. So there you go. So the most start around the age of six, and most cases occur, almost all cases occur before the age of 10. So you're not going to have somebody with, um, you know, childhood onset fluency disorder diagnosed at 11, 12, 13 years old. The prevalence is approximately 1% in the prepubertal children, and the male-to-female ratio is 3 to 1. So again, these are like the kind of testable statistics points. Prevalence is about 1% of prepubertal children, male-to-female ratio is 3 to 1. Uh, and symptoms often remit in adolescence. So they might say, you know, what do you do, or, or what's the prognosis for this, uh, for this disorder? And again, it might just be a wait and see kind of picture where most of the kids end up not having trouble once they reach adolescence. There is a family pattern associated with the disorder with the risk of first degree biological relatives developing the disorder at a three times higher rate than the general population. So again, if you have family members who have suffered from this disorder, the child is more likely uh, to suffer from that disorder. So mom, dad have uh, childhood onset fluency disorder, it's quite possible, or at least three times more likely, that their child may have it. And that pretty much covers the childhood onset fluency disorder, speech sound disorder, language disorders, and communication disorders as a whole. So I really don't want to dive into uh, in learning disabilities yet. I'll cover that in the next video. So we'll end it right there. That covers all of the communication type of stuff and basically what you need to know for the exam. Again, not too many testable points, but a few here and there that you might want to be aware of.